And I'll remind everybody again, this is the third in a series of Lineage Society um, webinars by Margaret Cheney. And I will put the first two, the, the first two are recorded and on our website. And if you wanna go back and watch the first two, I'll put the links in the chat. Um, also with the chat, if anybody has any questions, uh, put them in the chat and Margaret is very good about seeing them and stopping at an appropriate time to answer them. So with that, I will leave it to you, Margaret. Thank you, Lily, appreciate that. So I wanna thank everybody for coming today to watch this show. Um, this one is going to talk about putting it all together. Uh, we the last session talked about how do I start it and what do I have to find and what do I have to do. So you have gathered all your documentation and now it's time to assemble it and put it together. So did you read the rules and the guidelines? Did you remember you need to use source citations? And is your name and your contact information on each document, either on the front or on the back? Mm -hmm. All of our lineage forms are in PDF fill-in format. So you need to download the form to your computer first, save it in a folder where you know you're going to be able to find it. And then you will be able to fill it in and use it appropriately. The nice thing about downloading it to your computer and filling it in is you can do it in sections and you could do it at your leisure. It isn't something that has to be done all at one time. Remember, we do not want you to submit original copies because they will not be returned to you. Copies will suffice for what we need to do. Source citations are a must. We covered that in the last program. We will cover it a little bit again today. This helps make your work look professional. It shows that you are a true genealogist. And this is a requirement uh, that is in the rules and guidelines that all documents need a source citation. Source citations are not as hard as you think they are. And we are not uh, after a professional source citation. We are after a source citation that gives us uh, the who, what, where, and when of the document that you're sharing with us. The biggest tip that I can give you is do not number your documents until you have assembled everything. That is the last thing you are going to do. You're going to put all of your documents in order according to the ascent chart that you filled out. Now that means that when you fill out that ascent chart, you start with yourself and go backwards to your early ancestors. And we'll talk about that as well. The numbering for your documents will be in the upper right hand corner accordingly when documents are in the proper order. But this is the very last step that you're going to do. You're going to put it all together and then you're going to think about putting it together. So I may I made the mistake many times of um, trying to number my documents when I first did one. And I think I renumbered them six times and the white out up in the corner got really thick. So that's the really last thing you want to do with them. Make sure that the copies of the documents that you are going to submit are readable. The judges like to know about your family as well. And when we have an unreadable copy, it's very difficult to figure out what you're trying to tell us. If you could read it in the first place, 
try to make a uh, try to type out what the content of that document is saying. We all know that copies of things when they're recopied and recopied and recopied, they lose their clarity. Some of the newspaper articles that are online that we'd like to use are not of the best quality, even though we may try to refine it and make it a little bit better. But unless we know where that link came from, we can't go back and read it either. So it's best that if you have, especially in a, a newspaper article that can be very blurry, or let's say a will or the state uh, where the handwriting is different. If you can figure it out, either underline in red the important sections of that will or try to transcribe that section uh, so that we know what it's saying. Newspaper articles, including obituaries, should include the name of the paper, the town that the paper was produced in, and the page the item appeared on. And sometimes it's nice to include the column number for where it appeared, simply because in the old newspapers, they used to be eight columns. So being eight columns, the column that it would be in would be very helpful. And the old obituaries weren't listed as, as an obituary. It would simply be a small statement that would say, Mr. Jones died yesterday at his home. So it's very important, especially with old newspapers that you put the column number in as well. Make sure that the copies of pages from books include the title page of the book that shows the date of publication and the author. You will put that at the front of the page you copied from the book. The title page comes first, then the page for the book. Bible pages should also include a title page showing the date of publication. This is for provenance and to show the time frame of when it was written or filled in. I cannot stress enough to you that you have to read the rules of the Lineage Society that you are attempting to join. The rules and guidelines are there for a reason, and that is to help you understand what we need to help make a good application. We're not trying to put a lot of burden on you. We've tried to make them easy. Yes, they could probably be refined, but if you have questions, always contact the chair or the person in charge of the Lineage Society that you want to join because they will be able to answer the questions for you. This can sometimes be an, a confusing issue. The initial application is your very first time applying to a lineage society. So if you've applied to First Families of Ohio, and this is your first time applying, congratulations and thank you. That is your initial application. The supplemental application will come after the initial application has been approved. And I should have put in here in a subsequent year, not the same year you submitted the original. It would be in a sub subsequent year. You have found more ancestors that qualify. This is a supplemental application. And this is only for the initial applicant. It does not apply to children parents, siblings, or other people. This is where the supplemental application gets confusing because sometimes people will add their children on a supplemental application. That is not what that is for. So let's get right to the application form. I have pretty much put this into the PowerPoint because sometimes it's hard to pull up an actual form from the internet and let it go the way it's supposed to be. 
This is the first box on the uh, application form. And it's asking simply for your name, your address, your email, and your phone number. And your spouse, uh, we want the maiden name if it's applicable. You will use the light blue cells to enter your information. If this is a supplemental application, you would write your first families of Ohio number here or whatever lineage group that you were going into. So that really doesn't matter. And then your name goes here and this can be a typed name, a printed name, but then you must sign the application and include a date. You must sign the application in order for it to be reviewed. We do have people that uh, will submit CDs or flash drives. They have to be in PDF format. This is not the way to submit the application. The application has to be on paper, but the CDs and flash drives are backups only. Okay, why aren't we moving here? At the bottom of the page, you're going to see the block where you will add your ancestors. There's room for eight ancestors on this form. If you need more than that, if you have more than that, then you can use an additional sheet of paper to add those names and places. We want you to fill in the name of the ancestor the women will be submitted by maiden name, not their married name, their maiden name. You will show the year that they were first proved in Ohio, what you can find that proves them in Ohio. I may find, or the judge may find something earlier, but what you find would be the year first proved in Ohio, and then the county, and then what document in your application provides that information. Uh, Judy's asking, can your signature be an electronic signature? Yes. Although we prefer a personal one, but uh, because you're gonna have to print it out anyway to, to send it. So either way, you could do it either way. In the application, at the end of the application form itself, there is a checklist. And this checklist can be confusing or cannot be confusing. Uh, basically, it's what I use to judge with. And it's indicating that we have the birth, marriage, uh, remarriage, uh, spouse's birth and death and proof to the next generation. This last line is the most important line of all of them. You have to prove the lineage one link at a time. You have to prove that link between generations. So many times I will get people that will get to the fifth or sixth generation and they fall apart. They don't have any specific link. So that's the biggest clue that I can give you that on this checklist, make sure that you have proof of your generations from one to the other. The ascent chart looks daunting, but it really is not. It will start with your name and I believe this block starts shortly right after the letter I. So you can space over a few spaces if you want to, uh, to get that in line with whatever you're doing there. When you're filling this out, do not use what you think you know is right. You want to use 
what is on the document that you are using to prove the information. So if the document does not show, if the document does not show Aluria, Ohio, you would just have to say Ohio. Maybe someplace else it might say Aluria and that would count, but you would have to indicate what document that would be over here. You were born on, at, you married, who did you marry? Who was born on, died on, and you married at. Now, sometimes the people are living and that's fine. That's no problem. We're glad they are. We hope they enjoy sharing what you are sharing with us. The second generation, you start, I am the child of, and this will be your father's name or the male name. The male name will always go first and then his wife. So we have the same format throughout this whole ascent chart. And I believe it's like two pages long. So there's plenty of room for everything. Um, that can go along, you know, for what it's doing. The checklist that we talked about, you can check it off for your own records. You don't have to submit it with uh, your application. It is something that I use. I don't know if the other judges use it or not, but I do use it. They may use some other form. But it's your form to say, I have what I need to make this work. When you're filling out the ascent chart, you can fill it out pretty much from a family group sheet. And when you're looking at this, this is telling you what you have to find for documentation, because you want to be certain to include at least one supporting document for each statement. And then you would list that document with its corresponding number on the documentation for ascent chart. And again, we want you to make sure that your contact information and a site source citation is on the front or back of each document that you submit. Please do not use staples. I have to take them out. If you check your papers and you sort them very carefully and you number them correctly, you can submit them in the proper order and papers clips and staples don't have to be used. And we get a lot of that. We get a lot of office supplies this way that you can have for yourself. One of the, um, one of the things that you want to remember too is in your documentation list, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit too, there will be times when you will have multiple pages or you will have a document that is not a birth, death, marriage record, but it belongs with that person. So your document numbers on the ascent chart may not always go in order or be sequential. You want to make sure you're following the guidelines of the lineage group that you're going into. And that goes back to reading the rules. And we talked about the male is always first, regardless of the line that you are following backwards. Even if you're following your mother's line, you put your father first. You want to watch those dates and places for accuracy. We don't need, um, if it says January of 1915, that's what you use. Uh, you wouldn't use the 15th of January if you don't have a specific date for that. And unless you have a great deal of ancestors, and even then, there is no need to make out separate ancestor charts for different lines. There's enough room to cover quite a few uh, on our application form as it stands. But if you need more room, you can use extra paper to do that. So on that ascent chart, you're the child of, and remember, the male goes first. 
and all name changes for females must be documented. This is important. We do not use females by their married names. We do not allow them in. We need their maiden name. And that presents a problem in a lot of cases. A lot of cases you don't find it unless you find a marriage record. You may find it in a biographical record in one of the biographical books. Um, sometimes finding the maiden name for that uh, female is, is the most difficult part of doing something like this. Please add a generation chart to your application. You can use multiple pages if you're going back a long time. But this does aid the judges in following your family lines. And this applies even for supplemental applications if you're picking up from where you left off. And we'll talk about supplements a little bit um, in that way as well. Supplemental applications, you pick up where you left off from your initial application, but you also have to include a statement stating that that's what you're doing. Add the five generation chart and make sure you have the proper documentation again to go forward. So this is your documentation list. <clears throat> and it's saying that um, up here at the top, it says typed or hand printed or written copies of documents not certified as true copies are not acceptable as proof. Disregard that statement. Published or manuscript material authored by the applicant or his family will not of themselves be accepted as proof. That means if you put something on Facebook, we're not necessarily going to approve it. If you put something on Family Search or Ancestry, we're not going to pay close attention to that because you authored that. If you had an uncle write the family history 100 years ago, we might look at that. But we need the provenance and we need the time frame of when those things are done. The only time that we would need to maybe say that this is a true copy would be a translation of a uh, document in a foreign language. That would be uh, important for us to know what that document says. We have to remember, and I hope you all remember too, that all of our applications are based in uh, and judged individually. We do not have a one stamp fits all uh, criteria. We have our rules and guidelines, but we also judge each one individually for what it is. We are a bloodline society. Uh, adopted families and children can apply if they know their biological parents. The description of the document on the uh, documentation list is going to be numbered in the way that they appear in relationship to the ascent chart. So the number one document would be your birth certificate. The number two, well, actually, number two would be your spouse's birth certificate. Number three would be your marriage certificate. And then you go, number four would be your parents' certificate and uh, birth certificate and on to the line. Um, it's easy to follow. But remember, if we have multiple pages again, they're going to stay with that person in, in the way that you assemble the papers. But those document numbers may not appear on the ascent chart when you finally put it together. And if you keep all of your documents in order of ascent from you to the ancestor, you're going to work out just fine. That is the hardest part to do that. I think the first time I did it, um, I think the first time I did it, I sorted my papers probably at least six times. Uh, there's some questions in here. Um, if you've been married more than 
twice, yes, or more than once, yes, you have to show the name changes. You have to show all the name changes. Um, birth certificates um, may not be the only way to document birth because we don't have birth certificates going backwards. From 1867 to 1908 in Ohio, they were probate records. So probate records can be very helpful, and a lot of them are on uh, familysearch.org. And they give you the name of the parents, and often there you will find the maiden name of the mother. So they can be very helpful in doing that. If you had a grandmother that was married more than once, you need to document her name changes. That is important. The same document can be used to prove more than one fact. We're talking census records, Bible records, wills or estates. Now, if the same document has more than one page to it, like a will or Bible records, the first page is going to be the simple number. Your following pages would be A and B and C for however many pages you would have. So your first one would be document 21. The second page of the Bible pages would be 21A. The third page would be 21B. That means they all came from the same source, but you have multiple pages. When you're adding that on the documentation list, you can put the number of the document as 21 plus A plus B plus C, and we will know what that document is. You don't have to use a different line for each one. This is the documentation list that I filled out for Century Families of Ohio, where number one was my birth certificate, number two was my husband's, then our marriage record, the birth certificate for my father, the birth certificate for my mother, then the death certificate for my mother, the marriage record for my parents. My grandparents uh, were born in the late 1880s, so they were at the probate level. If you look at number nine, well, eight and nine both, there are two things on that particular document. On number nine, which I'm gonna show you as an example, there is the probate court birth record for my grandfather and the marriage record for my grandparents. And that can be done very easily. So here you will see that I have the probate court record at the top of this page. And you will see that I've got my source citation there. And then I have the marriage record below that they were married in 1907. I've included the volume and the page of where that record was found. And that's important. Source citations we talked about. Uh, we're going to formate Format our dates as the day, month, and year, such as 15th of August, 1865. Make sure your dates and places match in all areas. Now, sometimes if we are being super vigilant, we will check a five generation chart with dates and places against what you put on the ascent chart. We will also definitely compare what you put on the ascent chart to what the document says. We recently had a submission uh, where the person put their place of birth as one place, but the document definitely said another place. And the same for their marriage. The license came out of one place and the return came out of one place, but they said they were married in another place. So you want to make sure, and you would think you would know where you were born and where you got married. 
but we have to keep working on these sources and you have to be checking back and forth to make sure that you're putting in the right information. It isn't always the information that we think we know. It's what is the information that is being shown to us? What is really being spelled out in front of us? Now, the six elements of a good source citation include the author who provided that information, the title of what we're looking at, the publication information, which would be the publisher and the location for the, the title page, the date of the information, usually the year, and that's on the title page of a book, the location of where you found the document. What was the source you used? Did you find it at a library? Did you find it in an archive? Did you find it online? If you found it online, we just simply need the website of where you found it. We need a reference number to the specific information, the page, an entry line. Census records, we need to know the entry line for the family. For marriages, we need the volume and the page of where it was originally recorded. FamilySearch.org does have that information if you look for it carefully. It's usually at the top of the image. It will tell you that. If not, you may have to call a local courthouse or a courthouse in another area and ask if they can give you the information because you will have the date of the marriage and the names of the people and they might be able to tell you that. Another good way to get that information is to contact local genealogical societies because they often have researchers and they can find that information without disturbing the people at the court to do that. You want to record enough information so that another researcher can determine where you have searched and what you have actually found. This is very important for future use because as we know online information changes and sometimes what we see today is not there tomorrow or what we saw there six months ago is not there today but what we don't see today might be there tomorrow so again it's very important to put your source of where you found your information This is the example of a newspaper article. This happens to be my grandfather. He was doing his best to get out of going to war, but it, it didn't work. But actually, this was near the end of the war, and he never did end up going, um, going off. But we have the uh, source citation with the date, the name of the paper, the town, what page it was on. And we can see that we got it from newspaperarchive.com. So this would be your source citation here at the side for what this is. This was an obituary that was very unreadable. It was very poorly printed in the first place. And when you do a copy and paste or you try to abs pull that obituary out, uh, you're going to lose some quality in what it is. And it's going to make it harder to read. This is where if you can read it, put transcribe it and put that transcription in with everything else, because that is going to be very important. Source citations do not have to be in a bulleted type list with bullets. They can be any way. Uh, we don't particularly expect professional source citations. Um, we want enough information that tells us what the document is and what we should be looking at in within the document. Certain parts, if this uh, document and obituary was um, readable, you could underline or put an arrow beside it uh, 
pointing to the important parts of this obituary without having to read through this whole thing. Again, her source citation was so small that you couldn't even read the source citation of what she was putting in and where she had actually found it. This is the obituary for my great grandmother who died in 1956. And this is also giving the source citation. You don't notice this is not in a bulleted format. But this article is readable and we have a complete citation for it. It does indicate uh, who her children were. The only exception is here, it says one of her daughters was Mrs. Gonser. Her name was Hazel. So Hazel is not mentioned by name in this particular uh, obituary. So sometimes you don't get all of that. And a lot of obituaries will not give the name of the wife or the children. This is an example of a marriage record uh, for one of my grandfather's sisters. And on this one, it's interesting because the mother's maiden name for her is listed as Augusta Nowak. And as far as we know, her maiden name was Sprengel. We have found evidence of Sprengel being in the name. And there is no place else that her name appears as Nowak. So in this case, you would have to make a note like I have made here, that this is the only place that her name appears as Nowak and not as Springle. So what are we looking for when you send that application into us? Did you follow the instructions? Did you put your pedigree chart in there? Do your dates and places match? Are your documents numbered? Did you sign the application? No using gummed labels, no staples, and your name and your address on each document. So did you follow the instructions? That is what is very important. I'm going to tell you a little bit about using Word to build an application in. When I first did my applications uh, for Medina County, this was the only way that I felt comfortable doing it. If you're not comfortable using Word, then by no means is this necessary. This is not a process that you have to use. It's a process that I have found makes it much easier for me to use. In the first place, I'm going to scan all of my documents. I want to scan them in and I'm going to put them in a specific folder for the Lineage Society that I am joining. I'm going to create a Word file to do this in. So when we bring up Microsoft Word, we're going to go to File. Then we're going to create a blank document. We're going to go to Insert, a header, and a footer. The header drop down will come down, and you can just use the top one that says type here. And it will come up and we'll have a dotted line, and it will say header underneath the dotted line, but their header is going to be anything typed above the dotted line. So, where it says type here, that's where you will start typing. But I typed in the header that I would use. So, I'm using First Families of Ohio. And over here to the right, I'm putting doc with a line for the document number. I'm not putting any number there. This dotted line can be moved. This is how much room you're getting to put your header in. 
So you can take that dotted line and move it up about halfway and still have plenty of room to put everything in there you need. While you're on that page, you're going to just scroll down without doing anything else after you've done anything else and you will see footer with another dotted line. And you can move that line down as well. This gives you more room in the content of the page to put your information. So here in the footer, I'm putting the name of the applicant, my name and my email or mailing address, whatever you want to put for contact information. Now you have the elements of your application put together because now you have your name on each document and you have your contact <clears throat> information on each document. So now we want to add our document. So we've already got them in a folder. We're going to go back to the header and we're going to click on pictures and a drop down to menu will come up and it will say from this device online pictures, whatever. You're going to choose this device because your folder is on your device. So I went to the folder that I wanted and I picked the document that I wanted. And if you double click on that image, it will add it to the Word page. I'm going to show you a little trick that is very handy and it comes in very useful when you're doing this. And this is, if this is one tip you learned today, that's great. So if we right click on the document itself, it's going to bring up another box of information. What do we want to do with that image? And you're going to see wrap text. Over here at the left-hand side, we see wrap text. Another box will come up after you click the arrow. And you want to choose in front of text. Now you could go back and lift, left click on that image and move that image around the page for the best placement where you want it to be. You may want it to the left. You may want it in the middle. You may want it offset a little bit more to the right. You can also resize it if you need to resize it just a little bit by the little dots around the corners, pull one edge in a little bit more. You can also use uh, behind text and behind text will come in handy if you're doing um, a long obituary or newspaper article or pages from a book because sometimes you can line them up better. So this is a page where we have pulled that document in. This is a uh, Word document page that we've pulled in. Then we could go back and we could go to text and add a text box message to the page. And that text box uh, will hold your source citation or any other information you wanna add about that specific document. And again, you can adjust the size and placement of that text box over your document, next to your document, overlapping the document beside it. You do not want to obscure any important information that is on the document itself. Don't be afraid to experiment with the in front of text or behind the text because sometimes it does work better to use behind text. And most all of your documentation can be scanned into your computer files. It's a process, but it can be used for your entire application. And since I did it the first time, I have done it for all of them at, at this point. Um, and it looks very clean. It looks very neat of what we're doing. So I want to say congratulations. You're ready to submit your uh, application to a Lineage Society. Uh, if you have the time, I'm going to uh, change my screen share. And I'm going to show you what one of these uh, documents actually looks like in Word. So 
the Word document uh, that comes up, let me get rid of, uh, let me stop that share. Let me get this one up. All right, this one is um, the application in Word. You will see the name of the Lineage Society at the top left and the document number field over here. I've named the applicant. This is the birth certificate. It gives the information. You'll see in the footer, the name, address, and email address are all available. Sometimes email addresses change, so it's there. So then we have, we go on to see what the rest of it is. And we can see that uh, we have the marriage license. And I'd like to insert a small picture once in a while if I can, just to show the people as they were or who they were uh, that doesn't take up extra space on what you're doing if you have room for it. It's not a requirement. Another death certificate, birth certificate with the uh, source citations to it. This is my father's um, birth certificate and a picture of him as a baby. And the marriage record of my parents. Now on this one, you will notice that the license itself does show the parents of each the bride and the groom. This started happening um, after 1900. So this is another good source to find parents' names uh, if you didn't have it any other place. And then this was a picture of my parents when they got married. So you can get the idea of what it looks like in a word format. And then when you're done with this, you simply print it out. And your documents do not have to be in order in this. It's nice to do it in the order of what you're gonna do with the Ascent chart. And that helps make it easier to get it in order. But if you have something that isn't in order, after you print it out, then, you can put the document where it needs to be in the right order. And that's why you do not number until you get to the very, very end of everything else that you're doing. So now, if anybody has any questions, I would be glad to answer any questions that anybody might have. You can um, unmute yourselves to ask questions if you like. There's one question here in the chat box that, um, yes, yeah, scan your images and save them as, scan your documents and save them as images, not as a PDF um, in order to insert them. Uh, and yes, you can put transcriptions on the back. We usually like, um, actually, no, I don't want the transcription on the back. I want it on the front or a separate piece of paper. Because if the, applications are ever, um, if they are ever microfilmed or digitized, putting something on the back is difficult to view it. No legal size paper, all eight by 10 paper, please. Good question so far. Margaret, I have a question on the military okay. society. I have people in each war. How do I, do I need to, how do I do this? Okay, for so, so for the new Lineage Society, which is the Military Order of Daughters and Sons of Ohio, you can put your people in on one application. When you're filling out the Ascent chart, you have to make sure that you're filling it out and then if, if one is, if they're both from the same line, that's great, you know, that works. But if they're from separate lines, then you just start again and say, this person was the son of whoever and works backwards that way. You can do it both on one application. Okay. 
if you have if you have trouble understanding it, contact the chair. Thank you. Uh, Mary's asking for uh, deposition, wills, etc. Do we need the entire document? No, not necessarily. We need those pages that are pertinent to proving the lineage. So you would need a list of heirs if it's there, or if the will itself says I bequeath to, uh, you need that information and they will say to my son, to my daughter. Uh, I have a little trouble with one of my fourth great grandfathers because his his said to his legal heirs. And I had to, uh, the chair at the time would not accept that. Uh, because it didn't specifically say that they were sons and daughters, but the terminology used at that time was legal heirs for the children instead of spelling out the word children because he had like 12 kids. So that would take a little bit of time to, to do all of that. Margaret, I had a private question about, um, is it okay to handwrite document numbers? And I believe it is. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And the, the other tip is, Put it in pencil first. Put it in pencil and go through your documents one last time to make sure that you have them in the proper order. Have make sure that you have everything that you have right there. So you have to make sure they're in order, then you can go back and do it in ink. So you can do that. Uh, Brooke is asking, um, only those documents pertaining to verifying lineage, dates, places go on the ascent chart. Why would you list documents that don't prove any of those things? Those documents that don't prove any of those things are being listed on your documentation list to show what documents you have put in your application itself. So if you have birth, marriage, death, but you have found a will that you want to add, or if you found an obituary, you can use that. We talked a little bit in the last session about using find a grave. Find a grave can only be used for the tombstone picture that appears on the page with the year of birth, and the year of death. Any other information on that page is not considered uh, source for lineage because there's no way to know who put that information on there. Sometimes you will find an obituary or you will find a link to a biographical record from a book. And if the links are provided and a source is provided, that can be used, but they cannot be used to prove lineage. So when it says they were the son of, or they had these children, that is not acceptable proof. A marriage certificate itself is not acceptable. A lot of people turn in the marriage certificate that you have in your possession. Those marriage certificates are fine for every other living purpose on earth, for social security, for driver's license changes, for whatever. But for lineage societies, we want the actual return to the court. So that is where that comes in. If you're doing a proof argument, yes, that gets a separate numbered page. Uh, the proof argument, if you're using more than one person in that, you can put it, you can give it one number and refer to that one page number for multiple people. So that's the questions I have in the chat box right now. Does anybody else have anything? I do. Okay. I am the fourth wife. You only have room for one marriage. Right. The lineage application would be for my husband. So in his first wife and the children or through his first wife. Do you have to use a separate piece of paper and prove all of the wives or do you even have to prove that I'm the fourth wife if I'm not involved in the application? 
as the fourth wife, if it's the first time that you were married, there's nothing else that has to be done. Yeah. Um, males do not generally have to show the different marriages. Okay. It's so if fee, I'm doing a, an application for him and and I'm following him backwards, it doesn't really matter that you that I'm listing myself. Right. right. Okay. Good question. Thank you. Anybody else? I want to thank you all. I hope you all have learned something. I hope you all now get together for putting your lineage applications together. We want to be inundated this next year. Um, we're promoting our lineage societies. We have, you will get a certificate and you will get a medal for your hard work. And if you attend the conference, we have a lovely banquet where we recognize all of you and hand these out personally to you instead of having to mail them. Uh, we know that there's times when people can't be present and we do mail them out. And I think that it will be um, the next three years, the conference is going to be at Kalahari due to a lot of different issues. Normally, it is not at the same place three years in a row, but it will be at Kalahari in Sandusky, Ohio for the next three years. So we know where it's going to be. It's a lovely facility. It's, um, it's a lot of walking, but every place is a lot of walking that you go to. I think it's a good time to get your applications together and get them put in and uh, see what we can do to uh, help you honor your ancestors. We enjoy helping you honor your ancestors. Your ancestors may not have been famous. They may not have been state senators or presidents or governors or whatever, but they were the people that helped build Ohio to make it what it is today. And I think when we can honor our ancestors in that way, it's one of the most important things that we can do as genealogists. I always like to tell my people that when you're doing a lineage application, you are writing the book on your family history. You always say, I want to write a book. Your lineage application is a very good start to that because you are going to find the documentation that proves your lineage. There will be no doubt that you belong to that family. So that's your book. You're writing your book. So I hope everybody gets started. And I hope that we see a whole lot of applications come in this next year. You have until December 31st to get them to us or have them postmarked by. Thank you so much, Margaret. Margaret, oh, I, you're very welcome. I had a quick question come in um, yeah. privately. They asked, um, I lost it, about do you need um, how to handle Americanized form of a name without specific documentation of a name change? How do you handle that? Use the name that the person used most consistently. I have a great great grandfather who came from Germany and I've always known him as Charles William. When I started doing the research, his German name was Carl, K-A-R-L, Wilhelm. And when he came to America, he Americanized it. So that's what he was known by in America. But his birth name was Carl Wilhelm. So what I may do is if I found the German birth record for him, I would submit that and say that his name was Carl Wilhelm, but he later changed it to Charles William, which was the American equivalent of that name. And you will also find that a lot of the Germans use their middle name as their first name once they came over here. So you, you just have to kind of document it. You have to put it together. Uh, we will go by the name that appears in most of the documents that you have. Be consistent in the name that you use for them though. And we had one more question in the chat. Um, okay, uh, Diane is asking, she had a great, great grandfather and first families, but his wife was declined because of her name. Is it a 
folks, is it a supplemental application now to get in? Yes, Diane, it is a supplemental application. Thank you. I really work hard to get the females in. I will often search myself for a maiden name for them or see something. Or if it's a previous application, depending on how long ago it was, I may actually go to OGS and look up that application to see what documentation was in there. And if the maiden name appeared and it was simply overlooked, it, it's there, it, you know, it's, I do that. And I will do everything I can to get the women in because I believe in honoring every ancestor that you can do. Don't just go for the males, go for the females because they're just as important. Go for the children, go for the parents of the, of the people. You never know if a, if a woman was married in 1804 in Ohio, most likely her parents were around someplace. So try to find out who her parents were because those parents would qualify as well. And if you stop just with the daughter, you're missing another generation that you could put in. Thank you, Thank you very much. <laughs> you're welcome. And in case anybody missed uh, information in the chat, the videos from the first two are up. They're both under the resources um, and on YouTube. And if there are any corrected handouts, if you go to our events calendar and click on the events calendar, that event, um, all the updated information, even in older ones, is has been put there. So handouts and corrected information and all that stuff's on our calendar. And if there's something that you feel that you would like for a future webinar, um, anything, uh, please let us know because we want to we want to share with you what you want to learn about. We've enjoyed doing these, and we have some great resources in our people. Yes, we do. So I want to thank everybody for attending today. Good luck. And in, within a couple of weeks, this video will also be up online so that you can go back and refresh yourself. And these will stay online um, so that you can see them. And these are these will be free because of the fact that it pertains to OGS and it's something that everybody needs to know how to do is how to create a lineage application that will be a stellar application. And I expect stellar applications from all of you now so that we can have an easy time judging them when they come in. Thank you. So thank, thank you, everybody. Yes, thank, thank you. you.